Turn to the book of Genesis chapter 18 this morning, please. Genesis chapter number 18, verse 16. Genesis chapter number 18 and verse number 16. In Genesis chapter number 18 and verse 16, the Scripture says, And the men rose up from thence, and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come to me, and if not, I'll know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Amen. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. A wonderful blessing is the study of the life of Abraham. Abraham, folks, rises head and shoulders above just about everyone else in that Old Testament, save Moses. Abraham was a wonderful man, perfect no, sinless no. But Abraham was the very, very, very friend of God. In verse number 22 of the book of Genesis, chapter number 18, you see a picture of the character of Abraham. For he knew what was coming, and he knew that the Lord God was about to go down into Sodom and Gomorrah, and he knew what was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he knew that when the Holy Lord God walked into the midst of that place, that something was bound to change. So he stood before him. For he had a nephew in Sodom, and his name was Lot. And Lot had a family. And so Abraham, by true to his nature and true to his character, was interceding for someone else. He was thinking about someone else. And he wanted to do something to help them. And he knew that he could stand there before God. That was a, that was a very, uh, that was a dangerous thing to get in front of God because that's what he did. He stood before him. He got in front of him. He stood between Sodom and the Lord. And he, when he stood there, he was saying to the Lord, surely, surely I can say something that's going to change what's about to happen. Obviously, nobody in Sodom and Gomorrah was praying. No churches were in Sodom and Gomorrah. No prayer meetings in Sodom and Gomorrah. No witness of God in Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a pure hell hole on the face of this earth. And make no mistake about it to this very day, anywhere you find Sodom and Gomorrah, you're going to find the same thing. Nothing has changed. 4,000 years of human history and nothing has changed. Sodom is still Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. What a gracious man this is. What a marvelous man. What kind of a man is this? This, this man that was called from Ur of the Chaldees, called out of pagan darkness, called into light, followed the light that he knew. And the more light that he followed, the more light he got. And the more he received of the Lord God Almighty, the more the Lord God Almighty gave him. And my friend, that's a principle with God to this very day. Nothing's changed. If you want something from God, he'll give it to you. You get serious with God, he'll get serious with you. You want to know something about the Lord? There's more to know about God than you could ever live in 10,000 lifetimes. The reason you're bored to death today is because you're consumed with yourself. You fell in love with yourself. You spend too much time in front of the mirror instead of in front of the Word of God. Our problem today is not God. Our problem's not His Word. Our problem's not His Holy Ghost. My problem's me. How about you? So my friend, we find Abraham was quite a man. 
called of her the Chaldees and followed God. And now here he is, a man that was called from pagan darkness, standing before the Almighty, and he's interceding for a whole town, a whole valley of people. And there he stood. Lord, uh, there's something about Abraham that just touches my heart and my soul. Moses was a man like that. You remember when Moses, the Lord said, get out of my way now, Moses, move aside and let me destroy these people. And what did Moses say? Well, Lord, if you're going to destroy them, take my name out of the book that you wrote. Boy, what a thing. Have you met anybody like that lately? Have you ever met anybody in your lifetime that was so consumed with somebody else and not themselves? That's character indeed. That's the kind of character. If we had a little bit of that in Washington, D.C., we'd be better off right now. Make no mistake about it. Every mind seeks his own, the Bible said. They all seek their own. It's all about me, myself and I. It's all about how beautiful I am, how smart I am, how great I am. It's me, me. I love me. That's the problem. Amen. But in any event, that's not what I'm going to preach about this morning. I want to preach about the character of this man. I want to preach about who this man Abraham was. For this is Father's Day. And the Bible says something about Abraham. It doesn't say about anybody else in the whole Bible. He's unique in that. It sets him aside. And God, by doing that, says, look at this man. For there's something about Abraham that's different. It gets you. It grabs you. He loved God. He took his son Isaac to the top of Moriah, offered him as a sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord intervened. It was Abraham, my friend, who stood in the gap. He prayed. He sought the face of God. And God heard him. Here we find in the book of Genesis, chapter number 18 and verse number 19. This is what I want to call your attention to this morning. In Genesis chapter number 18, verse 19, the Lord said, For I know him. Man, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. And the Lord said, I know this man. Now, Abraham might not have known what all lay in his heart. He might not have known how he would have reacted to certain things. He might have made a mistake in the way he dealt with certain things here and there. But the bottom line is that Abraham was the friend of God. And Abraham was a man that God gave something to that everybody else benefits from the this very day it is because he believed in the Lord and God counted it for righteousness he my friend is the father of all the faithful Abraham's quite a man. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, for I know him. And here's what he said about him. He will direct his house. He will let no idols in his house. His people will go to church on Sunday. They will pray and read the Bible. It will be a Christian home. It will be what it ought to be. It will be at home what it is in here. He will direct his home. And Abraham did. This, of course, was in giving in direct uh, stark contrast with Lot for what had Lot done with his family. He lost them. He lost his sons-in-laws. He lost his daughters. He lost everything he had. Why did he lose it? Because he built it on sight and lust and greed instead of building it upon the Lord God Almighty. Abraham listened to God and because he listened to him, God blessed Abraham. And I had rather have the blessing of God any day of this week. I had rather have the blessing of God than anything this world has to offer. You cannot curse what God has blessed. And God blessed Abraham. So he said, I know him. He knows you. He knows me. He knows how I'm going to react. He knows how I'm going to lead my family. He knows how I live in front of my family. He knows if my family's ever seen me pray. He knows if my family's ever seen me read the Bible. He knows if I run out here and drink and get drunk all week long and chase women and do this and that and watch pornography and live like hell itself. Or he knows if I try my dead level best to live a Christian life in front of them. Amen. Amen. Take that to heart. If you're living a hypocritical life, don't make a joke out of the gospel of Christ and get religious on Sunday. Don't run up and down these aisles carrying and waving a Bible and live like the devil itself all week long. That's garbage. Abraham, he said, I know him. Now here's some things about Abraham that I want to call your attention to. The Bible in the Old Testament teaches that when a firstborn came forth from the womb, that it was something special about them. In the book of Exodus chapter 34 verse 19 look at that scripture with me this morning please. Exodus 34 verse 19 
The Lord said, And all that openeth the matrix is mine. That word matrix means womb. In plain words, the first one born of the womb. And every firstling among the cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then shalt thou break his neck. You see, you cannot buy back. That's what the word buy back means. An ass, a colt, a, a donkey. You can't buy it back because it has no value in itself. You must buy it back with something that has value. When the Lord Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem, he rode on the back of a donkey. The Bible said man that is born is like a wild ass's coat. He is born in the field, sniffeth up the wind. He has no value. Something else must be given in his stead. Are you getting this now? Man has no value lest someone else gives him value. I am not worth the powder and lead to blow me to hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing intrinsically valuable about me. I've heard preachers get up in the pulpit and say, well, God saw something good in so-and-so and he saved them like God needs your good. Amen. God saw something great in so-and-so, so God saved them. God doesn't need your great. Amen. God doesn't need your good. God doesn't need your talent. There's nothing about you God needs. You need him. Amen. You need what he has to offer, his gifts, his blessings, his power, who he is. The fact that he comes into your life, he will add immeasurably to your life. He will give you a life that you never possessed before. So a ass, the Bible says here, cannot be redeemed. In other words, you can't give God some money for that and buy it back to yourself in redemption for it's not worth anything. You've got to use something else in its stead. Now watch this thing in Exodus 34. And verse number 20. But the firstling would ask, Thou shalt redeem with a lamb. See the lamb? And if thou redeem him not, then shalt thou break his neck. And all the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem. And none shall appear before me empty. Now watch carefully the text. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem. You buy them back because they belong to the Lord. Why? Because the beginning of the strength. The firstborn child in the Old Testament was very important. It was very important because it was the beginning of life from, that pe from those people, from that group of people. It was the firstborn coming to the world. It was the beginning of strength. And the firstborn, notice what it says in Exodus 34. They shall not, the firstborn shall not appear before me empty. The firstborn in the Old Testament had the office of priesthood of their home. They were the priest over their household. They were responsible for the spiritual growth and spiritual cohesion of all in that household. Not the mother, the father. God has an order of responsibility. He has an order from heaven above down to this earth beneath. And if the father does not honor that responsibility, then it shifts to another, but he's left hanging. In the eyes of God, God is far more interested in your spiritual responsibility over your household than he is in how much money you make. The money's okay, but it's not money that pays your bills. God pays your bills. You say, the job that I work, that's what I make my money and that's what I pay my bills. God gave you your job. God could cause your company to cease to exist overnight. It is the Lord that puts food on your table. It is the Lord that puts clothes on your back. It is the Lord that put a roof over your head. And therefore the spiritual order, the succession of authority and power comes forth from the Father above to the Father beneath to the mother and to the children. That is a responsibility, that is an authority, and that's how the Bible holds it up. So the firstborn in the Old Testament was the one given a portion, double portion of the inheritance. If you'll remember that when Joseph brought his children before Jacob to be blessed, he had Manasseh in his right hand, but in his left place so that, Moses, so that Jacob's right hand would touch the head of Manasseh and Ephraim on his right. And when he brought them before Jacob to be blessed, Manasseh was in Joseph's left hand and Ephraim was in Joseph's right hand 
for Jacob to put his right hand on the head of Manasseh because he was the firstborn. And he would put his left hand on the head, on the hand of Ephraim, because he was the secondborn, and to receive the blessing. And when you read the book of Genesis very carefully, it'll show you plainly how that the blessing was greater for the firstborn than it was for the secondborn. But Jacob, in the wisdom of God that he had learned through years, in the spiritual attainment that God had given him, he did this. He crossed his hands. And instead of laying his right hand on the hand ahead of Manasseh, he laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim. And he put his left hand on the head of Manasseh, and he blessed them like that. And Joseph got very upset. He said, Father, you've made a mistake to paraphrase him. This is the firstborn. He said, I know, son, but this is the one God's going to bless. Amen. God's blessed me. I've been blessed. Oh, yes, I've been blessed. I have been blessed unmeasurably. And I want you to know this morning, if you ever get any blessing, if you want to scratch and claw and dig and scream and kill and backstep, backstep and climb over each other to try to make a way and make a living in this life, you'll never know the blessing of God. But if you yield yourself and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and give God his due and recognize the authority that comes forth from the Father through the Son, through the head of the household and the mother and the children, God will bless you. And when he blesses you, your enemies will try to curse you and he'll turn the curse back on their own head. Every weapon formed against you will not prosper. It cannot prosper. He said, I don't believe that preacher. Put God to the test and try him. I'm a father. I'm a father of one daughter, three granddaughters. I'm a father. God has blessed me by being a father. My daughter has had a father all of her life. She never remembers a day in this world when her father was not there. She has always had her father. I never had a father. I have no idea what it is for a father to instruct me in anything. I have no idea what it is to hear a father pray. I have no idea what it is to have a father take me to church. So therefore God said, son, I'm going to be your father. Now listen to my word and follow me and I shall become a father to you. And so he has. God has been my father. Amen, amen, amen. How many of you in this house this morning have had a father all of your life? Raise your hand. You ought to thank God for that. How many of you have had a father this morning you've ever heard pray? Raise your hand. How many of you have had a father that you've ever seen read a Bible? Raise your hand. How many of you ever had a father that took you to church, didn't send you, took you to church on Sunday to the house of God? Raise your hand. How many of you got memories today of a father who's no longer with you, but he's gone on to glory, and one day you want to see him again? Raise your hand. That's the blessing of God. That cannot be taken away from you. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. Amen. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. You'll see your father again. There's something about this filial relationship, this relationship of a father and a, and a son and a father and a daughter and mother and children. This is what God made. He made the family. We live in a society today that is anti-family. One of the major, major card companies in the country, one of the major card companies in the country have come out now with a new card, a new card for Father's Day. It's about a child having two daddies. Now, can you imagine what kind of a deal that is? That's no family, and that's not a marriage. And a child doesn't have two daddies. The child's only got one daddy. I'm talking about two sodomites living together. But you, the bottom line is this, folks. Card companies and car manufacturers and refrigerator manufacturers and air conditioner manufacturers don't preach the gospel. The truth is in the Word of God and the church of the living God. I don't look to them for guidance and understanding in the Scripture. This is the house of God. This is the church of God. This is the word of God. This judges GE, Westinghouse, Ford, General Motors, and Hallmark, or whoever else it is, the word of God. So therefore, I don't let them define what a family is to me. I don't let CBS, NBC, ABC, and the rest of them tell me what a family's about. I don't let psychiatry and psychologists tell me what a family's about. Who tells you, preacher, the word of God. You got a daddy cling to him. You got a daddy love him. You got a daddy respect him. You got a daddy honor him and obey him. You got a daddy, you got the order that God laid down in the word of God. God the Father, God the Son, and then the head of the house. And that's the man. 
Now, if feminism doesn't like that, the new church order doesn't like that. They don't appreciate that kind of preaching. They don't like that one bit. But look what your Bible says over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. There's a line of authority. When I was in the military, the first thing they taught me, the first thing in boot camp, I'll never forget this, the chain of command. You don't just decide to go see the commanding general one day. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> You're wasting your time, especially if you're a buck private. <laughs> Forget it. You have to go through the chain of command. There's somebody above you that's above them, that's above them, that's above them, that's above them. The President of the United States of America, Commander in Chief. Then we have a step below him, the Secretary of Defense. Then we've got a step below that, on down, 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 till it finally gets to your squad leader, whoever's above you. The chain of command. There's a chain of command in the Word of God. There's a chain of command in approaching God. You do not go to God Almighty without going through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're wasting your time. You might as well be talking to Buddha. You might as well pray to some pagan god, some Hindu deity. You've got to go through the son to reach the father. By going through the son, he takes you to the father. And so it is in your home. If you don't honor and obey your parents, then you have bypassed the chain of command. You say, well, I just don't respect my parents. You need to respect your parents. You say, well, my parents aren't the way they ought to be. You still ought to respect them. Because if you don't show respect, you'll get no respect. You earn respect. And if you may not approve of what they do, you may not approve of who they are or the things that they've done. But to this very day, the Holy Spirit says to me, love your mother, preacher, and love your daddy. Though you knew nothing about your daddy, love him. Because he's your daddy. He's the one who brought you into this world. Your mother bore you for nine months and gave you birth. Love her and respect her. And you do that and it'll do something for you. It may not do anything for them, but it'll do something for you. Some of these, sometimes it's hard for people to take something like that and receive it because they've been treated wrong. And I understand that. I know all about it. I know how people are treated today. I know all about that. But it's not about that. It's about what makes character inside you that will build you up in the presence of the Lord that will allow you to come before God the way you ought to. Amen. My mother wasn't perfect. My daddy wasn't perfect. No way, Jose. No way in the world. They had their problems. But I loved them, and I had to learn to love them because I didn't even know my daddy. I had to learn to love him. I had to learn to respect him, and I had to learn to love my mother. Now, you need to, leave, you need to walk out of this house this morning with that burning in your soul. Love your honor, your mother and your father. Your day may be long in the face of the earth. It's a command from God. It doesn't say whether they have to be perfect or not. Just love them, honor them, and respect them. And God will bless you. A person today, these kids today are taught that they're the ruler and master of all things. They play their video games all day long. They live in their own little world. And they'll go out and they'll kill you like they're doing a video game. They just got some up here in Rogersville, Tennessee, right east of Morristown, here in Tennessee. They've got these kids arrested for plotting a Columbine type massacre in their school system up there. They're going to go out and kill all these kids up there. They were going to murder a bunch of people. Kids today are so detached from reality, they don't even understand what murder means. They think it's just something else you do. Listen. You've been brainwashed. You live in an insane culture. Murder is a heinous thing because you're killing a human being made in the image of God. And so it is with the family. Learn to love your parents. Learn to respect your parents. Honor and obey your parents unless they tell you to do something that is absolutely unlawful against God. If it's possible within you to obey your parents and God Almighty will bless you because you're doing what he told you to do. Now if I got in here this morning before you and I'd say who's got the best daddy in this church? If I ask you a simple question, which one of you had the best daddy in the church? Some of you'd fight over your daddy. Some of you'd take the occasion to walk out the back door. But some of you'd fight over your daddy, and rightfully so, because we got some good dads in this church. We got some real good dads in this church. 
We got men who shoulder the responsibility to see to it that their family comes to the house of God and are faithful in the house of God. They're here. We got daddies in this church that are here every time the doors are open. We got daddies in this church right here that I know that their children love them and their children honor them and respect them. Their children may not live the way that daddy and mama does. The children may not live the way mom and dad taught them to live. But you don't say anything about their mom and dad because they love their parents. But I say to you this morning, kids, you're in here this morning, you're with your mom and your dad, and you're here with your Father's Day, and especially dad, since it's Father's Day. I'll tell you the greatest gift you could ever give your dad. And it's not going to be something you go out here and buy in some store somewhere, order online. Amen. It's not going to be money you take out of your pocket. That's easy. What's the greatest gift I can give my mom and my dad, preacher? On Father's Day, what's the best thing I could do for my dad? Love him. Honor him. Obey him. If you know something that breaks his heart, don't break his heart. If you know something that he believes strongly in, support him in it. For after all, I've been here a little while on this earth, and I found out that this generation 2014 one of the dumbest generations that ever lived. Amen. They think they know so much and they don't know squat. Amen. Amen. Our grandfathers and great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers were a whole lot smarter than we are. Amen. 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 Yes, Amen. Amen. They knew where we came from. Yeah. They knew where we were going. Yeah. They didn't have any problem with monkeys and apes. Amen. But they knew what a prayer meeting was about. Yeah. They believed their Bible. They believed in the living right. They believed in the things that today they just thrown out the door. It's not relevant anymore. Yes, it is relevant. Amen. Listen, if it's truth, it's truth. You say, well, that was truth for them, but we have our truth. That's relativity. That's the garbage you've been pumped in your head from school system and the government. What's relativity, preacher? Relativity is when you say, well, if that's your, that's your, that's your, that's your faith, your, your standards, your belief. If that's good for you, that's good for you, but I got mine. That's relativity. In other words, there's no absolute right. No absolute wrong, no absolute holiness, no absolute righteousness, no absolute truth in relativity. But there is an absolute truth, there is absolute righteousness, there is absolute holiness, there's only one absolute Savior, and His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is dogmatism. That's a dogmatic statement. What does that mean? Straight gun barrel right down the line? That's the way it is. There's only one name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's not popular in 2014. I know it's not. I know people today, it's just so much fly. They've got so much garbage going through their head. I mean, it's amazing at how much they try to ingest in one day and they don't know anything. People today are overwhelmed with information, but they don't know anything. And the reason they don't is because they've lost the things that make life what it ought to be. Right. Respect for each other. Love for each other. Honor and obey. The things you can't buy with money that are precious indeed. So you've had a mother in your house all your life? You've had a mother around you all, that you, all the time you lived? I walked out of the house where my mother was when I was four years old. I walked out of the house, never to return again. I left her lying drunk with a little brother crying. I was almost five. He was almost two. And we walked about three or four miles, five miles, two of us together, threw a blanket over the top of our heads. It was raining. And we walked together across the hill over onto Jerolman Avenue where my grandfather and my grandmother were living in the projects. And we came up to the door and we knocked on the door. And they looked at us and said, where in the world is your mother? And we came into that house and they gave us something to eat and we stayed in that house for the rest of the time until I went off into the military. Now that's how I grew up. That's how I grew up. And God blessed me because he gave me a place to go to. Because I had one aunt whose children were raised at John Tarleton. How many's ever heard of John Tarleton? Thank God for John Tarleton. This is no criticism of John Tarleton. Thank God for the fact there's a home over there for children. There's no criticism out of me. But the bottom line is that's all they had. Their mother and their father wasn't there for them. So these little children, all of my first cousins, all my first cousins, these little children were carried off over there to John Tarleton, and that's where they grew up. How come? Because the home was busted up. 
If the husband is right, it'll go a long way to keep the home together. Keep your home together. We live in a time when they're against the home and against the family and against the parents. They know what they're doing. These social engineers know exactly what they're doing. If they can destroy the parents, they'll destroy the home. If they can tear down the father and tear down the mother, they'll destroy it. Father, you've been given a sacred responsibility. You've been given a sacred blessing. You've been given a sacred position. You ought to stand up, they walk out this house and say, thank God I'm a father. I'm gonna take, take it serious that I'm a father. I'm a father, I'm a dad, I got children under me. I'm gonna to see to it that my children are raised up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. I'm going to see to it my children love the Lord. I'm going to take them to the house of God and we're going to read the Bible and I'm going to teach my children about God. As God said, I know him. He will direct his house. Amen. By the grace of God, since 1973, when God saved me, that's been my house. That hadn't been perfect. No, sir. But I never sent my family to church. I took them. Amen. Why? Because God saved this low-down stinking dog, wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, yes. and put something inside me. Amen. I went to church every time my wife took me to church, drugged me to church, forced me to go to church, hated to go to church, walked out of the church house, hypocrite bunch this, hypocrite bunch that. What, what are they wasting their time for? This is just a bunch of garbage. This is just a big joke. There's no truth in any of this. Pick them to death. Pick them to death. Go play pinball machines on Sunday morning while people were going to church. I didn't want anything in church. I didn't care anything about church till God came to me. <laughs> and then when he did... I got in church because I met him. Maybe that's why you don't want to go to church. Maybe that's why you have to be drug into the house of God. Dad, your children deserve better. Amen. Amen. They didn't ask to be born. They didn't ask what kind of home to be born into. They didn't ask for that. But here they are. Why are they here? I think God's got something to do with that. Amen. They deserve better. They deserve a mom and a dad. They deserve that. They deserve it. You could make this Father's Day a day when you walk out of this house this morning and say, Lord God, I dedicate my life as a father. I'm going to dedicate myself as a father. I'm going to be a father. You want me to be. I want my children to come up the right way. I'm gonna, if I'm going to watch their friends, I'm going to watch the influences that come from the outside. I'm going to watch what music they play. I'm going to watch where they go. I'm going to watch what they eat, what they drink. And plain of words, I'm going to watch everything they're doing. I'm going to be big brother to them. And they're gonna, they're, every time they jump, I'm going to see how high they jump. Every time they go somewhere, I'm going to see where they're going. Amen. I'm going to watch them because I'm their dad. Amen. You say, well, can't you just leave them on their own and let them find their own way? I like what Brother Roloff said. Lester Roloff. How many's ever heard of him? How many's never heard of Brother Roloff? Lester Roloff was a, was, a, was a man of God. That's all I can say. He loved God. He was a man of God. And he had a home down there for girls, and he had a home for boys down in Texas, Corpus Christi. Lester Roloff was one outstanding, fine man. But the state of Texas came against that man, and they fought him. They tried to destroy Brother Roloff. But here's what he said about convictions. He said, I'll tell you what, he says, these kids are going to live by my convictions until they get some of their own. Amen. Now, what's wrong with that? Nothing. <laughs> In plain of words, I know what's best for them. I know what's going to keep them out of trouble. I know what's going to keep them from getting hurt. I know. And folks, I, I say to you this morning, kids, listen, we want you to be happy. We don't want to, we're not going to put you locked up in jail somewhere. I want you to enjoy your life. I want you to have fun. I want you to play ball camp, whatever you want to do, go do all these. That's all fine. I want you to enjoy your life. But I know what's out there. I know what's preying on you. I know what's out there. I wasn't born yesterday. And so therefore, if I can do something to protect you until you find out on your own, I'm going to do that. As a daddy, as a granddaddy, as a great-granddaddy, as a great-great-granddaddy. If God lets me live to be 250, I'll be doing it until I live that long. Amen. I doubt seriously if I make it that far. I believe the Lord will come back long before then. I doubt if I make it another five years. I believe the Lord will come back. You're setting a date, preacher? I'm hoping for a date. <laughs> I'm set, Eddie. 
Give him your life. Dad, look what God did for you. Look what he's done for you. Look where you are. You're a dad. You're a father. You're a father, man. It's your seed that brought these kids into the world. Amen. Give him your life. In Jesus, in thy holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. The fathers would wake up here in the here this morning, Lord, and take seriously the responsibility in their home to take care of their wives, the precious mother of their children, and to take care of their children, Lord, and supply for their house. That not only means Heavenly Father put food on the table and clothes and the roof, it also means to take care of them spiritually. And Father, my Lord God, may you do that. May you do that in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen.